The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Well, good morning, everyone. Thanks for taking the time to join us for our eStewards certification webinar today. My name is Scott Jones. I'll be the presenter for this uh, webinar today. Uh, just to kind of give you a little rundown of what we're going to talk about here. Uh, we're going to start out with just a little bit about the eStewards standard. And we'll go through the certification process and the benefits of getting certified. We'll talk about some transition requirements that are pretty well, you know, at this point we're pretty well past the transition points, but uh, we'll just make everybody aware of where we stand with everything. And then we'll get into the standard overview, just kind of a general overview of the standard. We're not going to get too in-depth of the individual requirements. Obviously, we only have an hour for this webinar, so that would take a lot more time than what we have today. So I'm going to kind of just do a highlight of some of the key requirements and um, some of the documentation requirements to give you an idea of what the standard's all about. So at the end, we'll, we'll finish with a question and answer session. Hopefully, we'll have about 15, 20 minutes at the end to answer any questions that you have on the certification process or on the, the standard requirements itself. So my name is Scott Jones again. I am the EHS Program Manager here at Perry Johnson. I work out of our headquarters here in Troy, Michigan, just outside of Detroit. So if you have any questions uh, during the presentation, please hold them and then we'll answer those at the end. Feel free to type them into the question, the box on the right. Uh, that way, you know, you don't forget the questions and we can address them at the end and I'll go through each one of them. If you have questions after the, the webinar or uh, I can't fully answer your question during the webinar, my contact information will be up at the end of this presentation. So please uh, copy that down. You can shoot me an email or give me a call. We can discuss any questions that you have. All right, so for those of you who are not familiar with PJR, we are a certification body. We are able to grant certification to a number of different standards. We're accredited by ANAB as well as UCAS over in, in Europe and uh, many other uh, accreditation bodies throughout the world. But ANAB here, especially in the U.S., is the key one that we are accredited to. So here's kind of a list of a number of the standards that we are certified to uh, audit. We have eStewards, obviously, uh, all along with R2, which is another e-waste uh, responsible recycling standard. Rios, which is more of your, your scrap, ferrous, non-ferrous type metals recycling standard. That standard incorporates the requirements of ISO 9001, which is your quality management standard, as well as ISO 14001 and 18001, which are your environmental and health and safety standards. We are also in the pro process of getting accredited to ISO 50001, which is an energy management standard. So if you happen to be interested in going through that process and getting certified to an energy management standard along with uh, potentially e-stewards, you can do that. 50001 is easily integrated into a number of these, these different standards. So, And if you're interested in that, we're offering some significant discounts and getting certified to that. So contact me if you want more information on that. But here we go into some of the benefits of certification. So for those of you who are unfamiliar with eStewards, eStewards pretty much only addresses the hazardous components within electronic equipment. So that's what, that's what the focus of this standard on, making sure that this electronic equipment, those hazardous components do not end up being improperly disposed of, especially in developing countries such as Africa and India and China, or the, a lot of the Asian countries where you see stockpiles of old laptops and computers that are being smelted by uh, people without the proper protection and in the middle of streets, in the middle of, you know, next to ponds and lakes and contaminating the, their environments, making it unsafe and uninhabitable to live in. So. That's what the real focus of this standard is on. So some of the benefits, especially when it relates to data, is that you can show that you're processing this material in the proper way, that your any data containing devices are being secured properly, they're being destructed properly or sanitized properly for reuse or for recycling. 
this standard does not allow the use of prison labor, which was up until the SI2, which stands for standard interpretation number two for version two of the Eastward standard. So periodically, East Stewards will issue these standard interpretations, which help to clarify or may slightly revise some of the requirements in the standard. So you need to make sure that you're staying up to date with these SIs so that any changes that come out in these that you're aware of that you can implement into your system. So you can now use prison labor with the version two of the standard but under certain certain conditions. So you need to look in that SI for those specific conditions, but you can, under some circumstances, use prison labor, but you obviously cannot still use child labor or sweatshops. Uh, East stewards do not allow the use of incinerators to process the material. No hazardous e-waste will end up in landfills. East stewards recyclers operate a management system to achieve legal compliance with all laws, including the Basel Convention. So within East Stewards, you have ISO 14001, which is embedded in the standard. So when you get an East Steward certification, you're also getting an ISO 14001 certification. So basically what ISO 14001 does is it sets a framework to help companies ensure that they're staying in compliance with these legal requirements, that they're identifying their hazards, their environmental aspects, and they're putting controls in place to manage these to ensure that there's no harm being done to their employees, to the workforce, to the environment as well. And then finally, no hazardous e-waste is shipped to developing countries. That's one of the key requirements of this standard is that no e-waste can go from a develop, developed country to a developing country. So the purpose of the E-Steward standard encompasses the globally recognized certification, as we talked about, the ISO 14001 Environmental Management S System standard, prohibits all toxic waste from being disposed of in solid waste landfills and incinerators, requires full compliance with all laws and requirements, especially those export-import regulations, requires extensive ba baseline protections, so as part of this standard, you have to determine what the baseline is of your system, of the risk assessment of your facility to ensure that you are improving your health and safety, your environmental aspects, so you're not just staying constant with uh, you know, your legal requirements and the basic, the minimum requirements that you have to follow. These standards want continual improvement. They want you to be able to put goals in place and objectives and targets in place to improve your health and safety, to improve your environmental performance. So that's done by establishing these baselines to show so that you can show this improvement. And then lastly, it's written for international use. So any electronic recycler anywhere in the world can implement this standard. This standard doesn't necessarily identify specific regulations that you need to follow. It just, again, sets that framework so that whatever country you're in or whatever region you're in, you know that you have to follow those regional requirements and then obviously any specific East George requirements. So here's the steps to certification. This was taken from the East George website. This kind of gives you an overview of if you're looking to get certified to East George, you know, the, the 10 steps that you need to follow. So the first thing you need to do, obviously, is buy the standard, go through the standard, understand it, understand how to implement it, understand how the requirements will affect your organization. So for a lot of companies, especially if you're not familiar with ISO standards, a lot of companies may hire consultants to help them out because um, there are a lot of unique requirements and, and different things that you may not have the internal expertise to to understand and to be able to implement. So if you do not have this internal expertise, a lot of times they go with consultants, but that's step one. Next, step two is to get a quote from an accredited third-party certifying body such as PJR. Step three is to evaluate the costs. 
obviously there's uh, certification costs with getting certified, not only from an implementation standpoint from your organization, but also uh, from any certifying body, we have our certification costs to, to come on site and do our audits. Uh, and we'll go through that certification audit process in a minute. So once you get some quotes, evaluate the cost, you contract with your, certif your certification body. At that point, a company is eligible to be listed on the eStorage website as in process for certification. So it shows other organizations that you're taking the steps necessary to achieve certification. So especially if you have clients out there that uh, are requiring certification, you can show them through the eStorage website that you're, you're taking that step. After that, you have to pay an eStewards program initiation fee. Uh, that doesn't go through the certification body, that's paid directly to eStewards. And then you set up your management system to be in compliance with the standard. So you go through, make sure you have eStewards and 14001 will follow that PDCA cycle, that plan, do, check, act, that model for continual improvement. So you need to plan your system, which involves establishing your documents, your procedures, your forms. Once everything's established, your goals and objectives have been established, then you can implement, put it into practice, see how that management system is working. To verify the effectiveness of the management system, you're going to put some monitoring and measurements in place, such as internal audits, compliance evaluations, those type of things to ensure that your system is working properly. Obviously, as you're starting out, there's going to be changes that need to be made. Those changes are generally done if there's findings will be done through the corrective action process. You'll identify what the root cause is and then put a plan in place to make sure that that doesn't happen again. So that monitoring and measurement portion is put through the review process, generally through management reviews to see how effective was it, what needs to be changed, what can we do, what additional resources do we need, and then all that information goes back into that planning. So that's why it's a continual, continual cycle of improvement. So once you have that system in place, it's running effectively, then you can prepare for your, your stage one audit with the certification body. And we'll get into the specifics of these different audits. But once you finish that stage one audit, then you have your stage two audit. So the stage one and stage two combined make up your entire certification audit. Once you pass both of those, address any findings, which we call nonconformities, then we can issue that that certification. So again, there's you have to make sure that eStewards annual license agreement is executed and you have paid all your fees prior to your certification being uh, being sent to you. So here's the certification process. So you start with your stage one. Your stage one is your initial audit. It's really an audit to see how ready you are for stage two. An auditor will come on site, mostly they'll be reviewing their, your documentation, making sure your procedures and all that are in place and meet the requirements. They'll also be doing a tour of your facility to make sure that, you know, on the surface everything looks good, you have a lot of the controls in place. Once that stage one is done and you're deemed ready to move to stage two, this generally takes 30 to 75 days you'll have that stage two audit, which is basically the implementation of those procedures. So an auditor will come on site, look at the effectiveness of your system, make sure that you know, what you said you're gonna do, you're actually doing, look for objective evidence to verify that. So once that stage two is done, the auditor will provide any findings that were uh, discovered during the audit. Once those nonconformities are addressed, you put corrective actions in place we can then issue that certification. So that those two audits combined make up your, your certification audit. So once you are fully certified, then we go into the surveillance audit. So your surveillance audit is a partial system audit where the auditor will be looking at you know, some key areas that they'll look at at every audit, such as internal audits, management review, objectives and targets, those kind of things. But they'll also be looking at some of the key areas and areas of uh, you know, past issues where previous non-conformances were identified. So you'll have surveillance audits. They can either be, generally they're annual audits, but they can be semi-annual if you choose to, 
or if you have a number of non-conformances that happen uh, during the previous audits, we may make a recommendation to move to semi-annual to help you maintain and stay on top of your management system. You know, once you've gone through a few audits on the semi-annual, you're showing that improvement, then we can move you back to annual. So you have your initial certification audit, and then generally you have two annual surveillance audits, and then you follow up with your recertification audit. So every three years you'll have a recertification audit, which will be a full system audit, where we'll go back through, obviously, your entire system, making sure that everything is effective so that we can issue a new certificate for another three years. So each certificate is valid for three years, and then that process just keeps repeating. So here are the transition deadlines from version one of the standard to version two of the standard. So in May 1st of 2015, so about a month ago, was the deadline to transition to version two, and basically when every version one certificate became null and void. So if you did not transition by May 1st of 2015, you'd have to get recertified, go through that recertification or that certification process, the stage one, stage two audit, to version two. So at this point, no company can now get certified to version one. No version one certificates exist. Um, so if you're interested in getting certified, make sure you're looking at the version two standard. So issuance of multi-site sampling certifications with any excuse me, with any, uh, you know, the ISO standards, most of them can go multi-site certification. However, with eStewards, every site initially, before it's brought into the multi-site, has to be seen. Once every site has been seen during that initial certification process, then you can go to a sampling. So if you have 10 sites, you may only have to sample three of those for headquarters plus maybe three of those for surveillance. It varies depending on how many sites you have. So in this, for those of you who are unfamiliar, every facility that a company has has to be certified within a given country. So if you have five sites in the U.S., five sites in, let's say, Europe, if you want to get one site certified in the U.S., you have to get all five of those sites but you do not have to get the European site certified. So it's just within a given country. But if you choose to do one site in Europe, then you have to do all the sites in Europe. So the sampling, especially for 14, you may not see every site, for 14,001, you may not have to see every site in that three-year cycle, but for East stewards you do. So even if the sampling number doesn't require necessarily every site to be seen according to the e stewards requirements every site still within that three year period needs to be seen okay so that's the certification certification process now we'll get into more the the overview of the standard and some of the the key requirements of the standard so the standard focuses on hazard electronic equipment or HEEs so these electronic equipment to be considered a HEE needs to basically consist of one of the following materials or asbestos, batteries, cathode ray tubes or CRTs, these are the old you know tube televisions, circuit boards, lamps, switches or any other parts, materials, assemblies, housings, cables, wires which contain any of the applicable substances and levels exceeding the indicated threshold. So what you'll see in the standard it lays out thresholds for these different different elements. Uh, so if it's a, above this threshold, it qualifies as HEE. So you may have to get some equipment tested if you want to try to be exempt from some of these requirements because if it's below those thresholds, obviously it doesn't apply. Um, but sometimes the only way you may know that is to do testing on that material. So mercury containing devices, if there's any circuit boards that contain mercury or mercury lamps, switches, LCD displays, or any other parts, components, or assemblies containing uh, intentional inputs of mercury, these qualify as HEEs. Any PCBs or polychlorinated biphenyls, which a lot of those were in the older ballasts, 
So most material nowadays or most equipment nowadays isn't made with PCBs. I believe it was prior to 19, prior to the 1970s where most equipment was manufactured with PCBs. Uh, any equipment that contains radioactive waste or selenium and arsenic, selenium and arsenic is generally found in the, the older copy drums, uh, and then any other material deemed hazardous. So again, the, the standard, if you look up in the definition section of the HEE, will go over the specific thresholds and some of the specific criteria to meet the HEE. So then we get to the hazardous electronic waste. So it's basically any HEE that is destined or intended to be destined for recycling, energy recovery, or final disposal. Electronic equipment, including components that is tested and fully functional, but for which a direct reuse market has not been affirmed. And then deemed hazardous waste or banned for importation by the country of import or transit regardless of type of destination or condition of equipment. So generally, an HEW is something that's going to be destined for recycling, not reuse. But some countries, regardless of what the process is going to be, whether it's for recycling or reuse, may still qualify that as hazardous waste. So you may still have to identify that as an HEW. So that's why it's important to know not only the regulations within the country, that you're located, but also the regulations for any country that you are exporting equipment to. And not only the country that it's going to, but any transboundary countries as well. So the next concept within, key concept within the e-stewards is the potentially hazardous processing technologies. So these are technologies or activities, operations, which process hazardous, hazardous electronic equipment and or problematic components. So there's a definition within the standard that talks about problematic components as well. But these PHPTs include shredding, cutting, grinding, crushing, breaking, bailing, a number of these physical methods to process equipment. So if you're operating a PHPT, it opens a whole can of worms pretty much as far as what type of risk assessments need to be done, you know, the extent of your closure plan. So there's, if you're having PHPTs on site, there's a lot more additional requirements that need to be met. So aside from the physical processing, you have the opening, uh, dismantling or repairing mercury containing devices. So if you're taking LCDs apart and you have mercury in them or you're removing mercury bulbs, that's considered a PHPT because if you start breaking bulbs or you have issues with the bulbs, basically these PHPTs will produce a lot more hazardous, uh, harmful effects to the human health and the environment. So in eSewards, EMS, Environmental Management System, applies to the electronic equipment, property, and assets under the organization's ownership and or control, and workers, including temporary, part-time, and contract workers, or volunteers and interns. So here's kind of a layout of the eSwords EMS policy. Similar to your 14,001, you require to have a policy in place. The policy needs to touch on certain key requirements that you need to include into that policy. So it talks about prevention of exports of hazardous electronic waste uh, throughout the recycling chain, which violates international laws, treaties, and agreements, uh, making sure you're not using forest or child labor throughout the recycling chain, the prohibition of prison uh, operations throughout the recycling chain. Again, that has sl been slightly revised in this most recent standard interpretation, but um, so make sure you're aware of some of those changes. Uh, and then the social account accountability values. Uh, you don't have to be certified to this SA 8000, which is a social accountability standard, um, but some of these requirements within the standard still need to be applied uh, into your, your system. So here we have the environmental and the stewardship aspects. So at least every three years, a risk assessment needs to be conducted. 
So this needs to be conducted by an occupational, environmental, health, and safety professional. There are some requirements as far as uh, in around who would qualify for this, um, but ultimately a lot of this is left up to the organization to come up with competency requirements to determine who is capable of performing this risk assessment. So, but at least every three years or as significant changes occur within an organization, you need to conduct a risk assessment to ensure that you're capturing all those environmental and, and stewardship aspects. So this risk assessment shall give consideration to the customer data privacy, downstream risks associated with these the HEWs, the hazardous waste management released to the environment, such as stormwater runoff, air emissions, transportation. So it's looking at every aspect of your operations, uh, especially any transportation that you're responsible for and making sure that you've identified all the, uh, the health and safety hazards in the environmental aspects. Looking at physical hazards, chemical hazards, biological hazards, uh, practices to decrease worker exposure and take home contamination. So you should have controls and processes in place to make sure that, especially for uh, employees if they're dealing, let's say, with lead, that they have you have a process in place so that they're not necessarily or potentially wearing that same clothes or those same boots home and bringing that lead contamination into their homes. So coming up with accident investigations uh, and then identifying any other uh, applicable hazards. So I, as we kind of talked about, one of the key requirements of, of 14 for those of you who are familiar with it, but even more so with these stewards are the legal export, transit, and import requirements. So you need to make sure that you fully understand your whatever country you're located and what your internal country requirements are, but then any transit country, any end country, what their requirements are. This, If any issues are identified with this, is generally an automatic major nonconformance with your system. And, and could potentially lead to suspension. So ensuring that each shipment of hazardous e-waste is exported or import, imported only as follows. So the implementation of the Basel Ban Amendment. So when exported from OECD or EU countries, uh, shipments shall only go to and through countries in that same group. And the trade is for recycling and not final disposal. So this is very different, say, from the R2 standard where R2 does allow electronic equipment to be sent to developing countries, as long as it's not going against any legal requirements. Whereas the stewards only allows to export to countries in that same group. So it has, if it's a developed country or an OECD country, it has to go to another OECD country. It cannot go to a developing country. So the implement, implementation of trade between or the trade ban between Basel parties and non-parties and the implementation of the Basel Convention, regional agreements, and national laws. So here's kind of the, the hierarchy to determine where material should go. So the most preferred method is going to be direct reuse of tested working equipment and components. So any equipment that has the potential and has the market to go for reuse needs to go for reuse. Obviously, if you have you know, 10-year-old equipment, you may be hard-pressed to find a market that justifies testing that equipment and processing that equipment. You most likely will not get your money out of that. So that can potentially go to recycling. But any equipment that there is a market for you, and you can sell it and make a profit on it, you have to look at that as your first option. If you don't have the methods to do that on-site, you need to look at an organization downstream who has the ability to process that equipment and potentially send it for reuse. So if it cannot go for direct reuse, you, need, you should look at refurbishment of that equipment, if it makes economic sense, obviously, and send that for reuse. And then it can go for materials recovery for use in new products or applications. So that's more the recycling. You may send it to a smelter or a refiner to kind of pull out some of those metals that can be reused. Uh, and put into new equipment. And then as a last resort, disposal. Uh, but ideally, everything's going to go for reuse, refurbishment, or uh, 
uh, materials recovery. So next we have eliminate and mitigate significant environmental and stewardship aspects. So the ongoing occupational health and safety and industrial hygiene program shall include but not be limited to the following. So the standard does require you to have an industrial hygiene program in place. So some of those requirements include airborne hazard controls and, and a lot of this depends on the type of processing that you're doing. Some of these may not be applicable. So housekeeping, housekeeping obviously everybody can do that, ergonomic controls, there's going to be ergonomic issues regardless of the type of processing that you're doing. Uh, but noise controls, you may not have any equipment on site that would have elevated noise levels to, to require you to implement these noise controls. But that's part of your risk assessment. So your risk assessment is going to go through all those potential hazards, identify the ones that are applicable to you, identify the ones that need to be controlled if they're not already controlled. And so then lastly here we have the controls for significant environmental and stewardship aspects. So you want to start obviously with your more significant ones. So as, as far as defining what's significant and not significant, it's kind of up to the organization to come up with a method to determine based on what you have in your, your facility, what's going to be significant for you. What's significant for you for one company might not be significant for another company but you need to determine and have a, a defined system in place to identify what's significant and then make sure you put controls in place to reduce that level of potential hazard or potential uh, impact on the environment. So here we have, and this is taken from the standard, but we have kind of a layout of the process for reuse and refurbishment of electronic equipment. So fully test electronic equipment and ensure full functionality. You want to sanitize any customer data. Label identifying records of equipment for reuse. And then it goes over to D, provide protective packaging. Verify and document the reuse market. Take back any broken equipment. So if you ship anything out, it happens to get broken in the process, make sure you have a take back program or a return policy in place to take that equipment back to make sure that it's either sent back for refer or it's put through the refurbishment process or sent to recycling. But either way, you need to have a return policy in place to make sure that material comes back to you so then you can make sure that that equipment is processed in the right way. Ensure responsible management of e-waste and then control outsourced reuse activities. So if you're sending something downstream for refurbishment or for testing to make sure that they're either e-steward certified or they have the, uh, the procedures in place to make sure that all equipment is being handled in accordance with the e-steward's requirements. Reuse and refurbishment of electronic equipment for fully fully test electronic equipment and ensure full functionality. So to do this, you need to determine and document the state of health of each rechargeable battery. Now, depending on the type of battery, the standard lays out specific criteria of, as far as like battery life left um, that the batteries need to meet. So make sure that you understand what those specific criteria are for each battery. Determine the state of health of each mobile phone battery destined for reuse. Determine that photovoltaic uh, modules destined for reuse are capable of producing power output that is at least 50% of the original power output. And then test CRT devices uh, that are destined for remanufacturing. Obviously, there's not a whole lot of market right now for the CRTs. It's pretty much ancient technology at this point, but there are a few places and a few regions in the world where there are CRT remanufacturers, uh, but you need to make sure that they are uh, processing it properly and there actually is a market and they are actually sending it to uh, reuse. So the this is really one of the key aside from you know, the risk assessments and making sure that the environment and the the workers are safe, the accountability for downstream recycling which incorporates a lot of that risk assessment. You want to make sure you're sending the material to a downstream facility that has the technology and the ability to process this material appropriately. So you want to maintain a downstream disposition chart of all HEWs and PCMs, your 
problematic uh, components. So making sure that this is up to date, making sure that anybody who any downstream vendor or supplier who's on that chart is uh, is has been approved and has been gone has gone through the audit process. So you want to make sure you've conducted that due diligence and ensure the responsible management of the PCMs. So there's different due diligence depending if they're East Steward certified or not East Steward certified. So make, making sure that you understand those different requirements. Obviously, if they're East Steward certified, it's going to significantly decrease the amount of due diligence that you have to do. But make sure that you understand those differences. Conduct ongoing due diligence on all immediate downstream processors of HEWs and ensure responsible management of the HEWs. And then conduct ongoing due diligence to ensure responsible management of HEWs beyond the IDPs, uh, which are your immediate downstream processors uh, throughout the recycling chain. So those IDPs really are more the, the tier ones. So as part of this accountability, you need to evaluate, perform on-site audits. So this is one, for those of you who may be familiar with R2, this is one difference where you have to, the standard specifically says you have to do on-site audits and approve each immediate downstream processor or IDP. So annual on-site audits for all IDPs unless the IDP has a current and valid e-steward certification. If the IDP is an end processor, on-site audits shall be conducted at least every three years. So if they're an end processor such as a smelter, then you can do the on-site audit once every three years. So next we have restrictions on materials recovery and final disposition operations. So A, you want to ensure that the facilities are licensed and permitted. Ensure they use the best available techniques and technology. Disallow certain types of management downstream. So especially if you have certain requirements that are coming from a customer, you want to make sure that your downstream processor is not handling or processing the material that goes against your customer requirements. Ensure HEWs don't go to solid waste disposal. Get approval from alter alternative use, uses of HEWs and then restrict HEWs and PCMs to specified destinations. So eStewards requires you to track your electronic equipment. It requires a mass balance. So an organization shall implement and maintain a documented system for tracking all electronic equipment entering and exiting their facility and under their control. So the organization shall track all electronic equipment, implement material mass balance accounting, link material balance accounting with shipping records to downstream vendors. So basically everything that's coming in that's electronic equipment needs to be tracked in some manner, whether it's by weight, whether it's by uh, specific serial numbers, however that's done, it needs to be tracked coming in. And then any material that's, whether it's destined for recycling or whether it's destined for reuse, needs to be tracked. So let's say at the end of the year, you can look at that mass balance and know this is how much I've had come in, this is how much I have go out, and this is how much I currently have on site. So that should, which is obviously not the easiest thing to do, uh, and depending on how your current system is set up, uh, it may require some significant modifications to be able to to have that mass balance in place. And then you have to report to the eStewards database. So prior to initial certification and then by January 31st of every subsequent year, the organization shall provide the following data for each calendar year to the confidential eStewards database regarding all electronic equipment entering their facility and under control and under their control. So that mass balance that you created, you need to basically pull that information and provide it to the eStewards database. So you need to provide the address for the primary location and description of the site, the number of individuals who worked for more than one month during the 12 month period, description of all processes taking place at each site, and then the total weight or unit count. Again, you can do it either by uh, you know the mass weight or by individual serial numbers or however you want to track that but the total weight or unit count of electronic equipment components and material processed and in inventory and under organizational control so those are really the core requirements of the standard 
obviously there's a whole lot of details within those requirements that I did not touch on and we don't really have the time for, but I wanted to make sure that you at least had a general understanding of the certification process, make sure you understand kind of what uh, what are some of the key concepts of the steward standards, maybe how it differs a little bit from R2 if you're familiar with R2. Um, obviously if you're looking at e-stewards it's a little bit more prescriptive, it's a little more involved uh, in some ways than R2. So. There's uh, there's a little bit more to implementing an e-steward system. There's a lot of good benefits that can get you can take out of implementing an e-steward system, though. So at this point, if you have any questions, I'd love to to take those. I know we don't have too many people on the line, so but if you have specific questions on how certain requirements may you know affect your facility or I can't, as a certification body, we can't tell you how to how to do certain things. We can't consult, but we can definitely clarify what the requirements are and help you understand those requirements and how they apply to your facility. So uh, as you're going through implementing the system, if you have questions, feel free to contact me. Uh, if you have questions on an audit, during an audit, after an audit, you can contact me. Um, if you're looking for a quote, just to kind of get a feel for the cost of certification, Shoot me an email, give me a call. I can uh, get some information information from you. We can come up with a plan to uh, that will work best for you as far as costs and, and time frames go. So if you don't have any questions, uh, I'll wrap it up here. But uh, if you do, feel free to type them in the question box. But on this page, I've listed some resources for you. Here, the first one is uh, PGR's website, www.pgr.com. We also have the eStewards.org website, as well as the BAN website, uh, and then ANAB, who we are accredited by to grant certifications. Uh, so if you want additional information, you can go to any of those sites. And then here we have my contact information. So I'm the, like I said, I'm the EHS program manager. I, I manage the eStewards program, the R2 program, Rios, ISO 14001, OSAS 18001, ISO 50001. Um, so if you have any questions on any of those standards, you can contact uh, myself, uh, my email up there, and phone number. We also have the uh, 800 number uh, for the sales department. Uh, if you just want, kind of want a rough, rough estimate, you can shoot me an email as well, and I can help you out or point you to the, uh, the right person. All right, well, at this point, I don't see any questions, so I uh, appreciate everybody's time, uh, taking the time today to, to join us. We have a number of other webinars coming up, uh, especially on ISO 14001 and some of the updates that are happening uh, with the new version of the standard, which is expected to be released sometime, uh, probably September, October of this year. And we'll, in the next uh, few webinars that we'll have over the next few months, we'll discuss some of the specific changes to the standards and what you can expect as far as implement, implementing these standard, the standards or transitioning to these standard, the new standard. Uh, so if you have any questions on any of that, give me a shout and I'll be happy to answer those for you. Otherwise, thanks everyone and have a great day.